Hey, good morning and welcome to Collective. Um, we are so glad you guys are here today. Before we begin, I want to bring your attention to the connection card that was on your seat when you first came in. Uh, one thing we'd love for you to do each week is to fill out this connection card, whether this is your first time or second time or you've been here uh, since the beginning. We'd love for you to fill this out, and there are three reasons why. The first is this. If you are a first-time guest and you fill out this card, what we'd love for you to do is later hold on to it and take it out to our welcome table where you'll see the, the big pallet wall. And for every first-time guest that turns in a card, we actually donate $2 to a local organization. And so this quarter, we're doing the Frederick Rescue Mission for their toy drive coming up this Christmas. Um, that's, that's probably Mike from the Rescue Mission. Um, and what's really cool is through two weeks, we have $108 set aside for this toy drive. And so if you are here for the first time, what we'd love for you to do is to fill out that card and help us invest in this community. And so fill it out, hold on to it, and drop it off a little bit later. Now, if you're a second time guest, we also want you to fill it out and hold on to it and bring it to the welcome table because we actually have a gift for you as our way of saying, hey, thank you for coming back to Collective. Um, it is easily the most comfortable shirt you will ever wear, so you definitely want it. And so fill out that card, bring it up front. Uh, we'd love for you to turn that in. And then for everybody else, even if you've been here, you know, this, I think this is our fourth week, even if you've been here all four weeks, we'd love for you to fill this out because one, we'd love to know that you were here. And two, we'd love to take the opportunity to pray for you. And you'll notice at the bottom of those cards is a block that says prayer request. And our staff gets together on Wednesday mornings and we, we pray for you and, and we want to pray for you. And so we'd love for you to fill that out. Uh, you can hold on to it and turn it into the Welcome Center later or a little bit later when we do offering, you could put it in the basket. So I'm going to put a picture on the screen and I want you guys to tell me what you see. Now this isn't a trick, I promise. All right, you guys ready? Okay, what is that? Yeah, some people are like, earth? Like, uh, okay, how would you describe the earth? Yeah, round. Anything else? Just round. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so words that you would describe the earth, you might, you might reference its color, you might reference the blue or the green, but the first thing that you guys said was round. You know, maybe you think sphere or circular, but ultimately when you look at the earth, you see that it's round. And it's pretty obvious that looking at pictures of the earth, that it's round. But did you know there's a society called the Flat Earth Society that currently includes 500 members who believe that the Earth is flat? <laughs> this group, <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> this group includes rapper B.O.B. and NBA champion Kyrie Irving, as, long, as well as a group of other people. And so the Flat Earth Society actually believes that the Earth is flat, much like the philosophers and astronomers did a few hundred years before Jesus' time. One of the things that they believe is that the North Pole is actually a wall of ice. So if you travel too far north, you actually run into a wall before you have to turn back. Some of them believe that if you sail to the eastern or western edge of the ocean, that you'll fall off. And Flat Earth Society does not lend much credibility to photographic evidence and believe that images that have been taken from space have actually been photoshopped. And they believe that our astronauts, when they've gone up to space to take these pictures, are actually paid by the government to create this conspiracy theory. And while this might be hard for us to believe, uh, they believe and they come to this conclusion through a mixture of science and what they deem as common sense. So here are some of the ways that the Flat Earth Society believes that the Earth is flat. These are the facts that they give on their website. Fact number one, the world looks flat. <laughs> Fact number two, the bottom of clouds are flat. Which honestly, when I read that, I'd never thought about that before as like a reason, but that's one of their reasons. Fact three, the third reason why they believe that you can believe uh, that the earth is flat is through this thing called the Bedford Level Experiment where they've gone over six mile stretches of water and they say if you look for six miles, you'll notice that the earth doesn't curve but in, flat, but in fact stays flat. And so this week I spent way too much time researching the Flat Earth Society and I came to one conclusion. I totally agree. No, I'm just kidding. I don't agree. The earth is round. But for people who believe that the earth is flat, it doesn't matter what pictures they might see. It doesn't matter the evidence that NASA has. It doesn't matter that if you sail in one direction for a long enough time, you actually keep going around in a circle and don't run into a wall or fall off the edge of the earth. But there are people who still have trouble believing that the earth is round. You know, as funny as flat earth theory is, the reality is sometimes believing is hard. The 500 people who believe in this theory have never been to the moon. They've never seen the earth from the angle that we just saw it out outside of pictures. These are people who haven't traveled to the North Pole to realize that it's not a wall of ice that stops you. And because they've never experienced these things, they have trouble believing that it's real. And while we might not totally relate to the flat earth theory, 
I kind of understand what it's like to be a skeptic or struggle to believe in something, especially when you haven't experienced it for yourself. Maybe some of you feel that way when it comes to God. If you were being honest, you would say that you struggle to believe. Or maybe you'd say that you're skeptical. Or maybe you just flat out say you don't believe at all. And so today I want you to know that no matter where you are with your belief, God is for you. And that even in your unbelief and in your doubts and your skepticism, God is for you. Because God is for the unbeliever. And this is week three of our series, God for the Rest of Us. And week one, we talked about how God is for the outcast. Week two, we talked about how God is for the go- forgotten. And today we're talking about the fact that God is actually for the unbeliever and for people who struggle to believe. One of the most popular verses of all time, one that um, a lot of people know, or maybe it was back like in the early 2000s, you'd watch like a sporting event, you'd see somebody holding up a sign that said John 3.16, one of the most popular verses in the Bible. And this is what it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And what's really cool about this verse, and the reason why I think so many people love it, is because when you read it, you realize that God's love comes first. That God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him. God's love isn't necessarily contingent on our belief. It wasn't you believe first and then I will love you, but his love came first. Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus wants us to have peace. He wants us to have rest. But he doesn't say, come to me, all who are believers and believe this very specific thing and have no doubts and have no fears, and I will give you rest. He says, come to me, every single person, all who are weary and burdened. Those are just two examples of Jesus proving that he's for everybody. But even if you don't believe, even if you're not sure God is for you, you don't have to believe in order to be loved by God. And your belief doesn't have to be perfect, or without flaws, or without doubts, or without skepticism. And so the first thing I want you to know, if there's only one thing that you take away today, this is what we want you to hear. We want you to know that collective is a place where you can belong before you believe. You can be a part of a community even though you're a skeptic, even though you have doubts, and you can serve even though your goal isn't to show the transforming love of Jesus to this community. You know, that's why we are involved in this community. We want people to know that Jesus' love can change lives. And we want people to know that we're not just serving, but it's transforming. And the reality is you might not be sure about that. You might have doubts about that. You might not believe it. But we want you to know that we still love for you to be with us and serve with us. That your belief doesn't stop you from being a part of this community. A few years ago, I worked in a church in Annapolis where I met this couple named Drew and Teresa Robertson. And these people are incredible, two of the best people I've ever met in my life. And the first time I met Teresa, I was actually walking into church and I was wearing a t-shirt that said beat cancer on it. And as I was walking in, she made a beeline straight for me and she was like, I have to know where you got that shirt. And so my sister actually designed it. We did it for a fundraiser, and I explained to her that cancer is actually something that has devastated our lives, and so uh, we wanted to do this fundraiser in order to raise money to support cancer research. And as Teresa looked at me, she didn't continue to push about where that shirt came from. In fact, she just hugged me and said she was sorry, and then I walked away. Over time, I I got close to Drew and Teresa and got to know them a little bit better, and I found out that Teresa really struggled to believe in the whole Jesus thing. Uh, In fact, she did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God and the fact that Jesus resurrected from the dead. Like a lot of people, she believed that Jesus was a real person and had good teachings, but she struggled with the whole God aspect of Jesus. I know a lot of you understand that. But what's really cool about Teresa is, is even in her doubts and in her insecurities, she still showed up every single week to go to Revolution. And one of the reasons why was because the church was a place where she could belong before she believed. Nobody treated her like an outcast or a heathen. People didn't look at Teresa like a project, like they had to prove something to her. But as somebody who was actively pursuing their faith, somebody who wanted to surround herself with people who did believe in varying degrees, and and somebody who wanted to serve and be a part of this community to learn, is this something that I can believe in as well? the reality with Teresa is that she struggled. 
Even to this day, Teresa still isn't quite sure what she believes. But what I love about Drew and Teresa is that even though she's not sure, she still serves, and she's still in community. In fact, Drew and Teresa have financially supported Collective for two years, even though she's not really sure what we're doing is what she believes. She believes in people, and she believes in this community, and she wants to learn more, so she's investing as much as she can. And Collective is a place where you can belong before you believe. We don't all have to think the same thing about Jesus. Our hope as a church is that if you spend enough time at Collective or meet enough people here or, or, or read enough scripture or spend enough time listening, that eventually you will believe. Our hope is that one day, that even in your doubts and in your skepticism, our hope is eventually that you do believe that Jesus was the Son of God and that he resurrected from the dead and that he will give us rest and that he does love us and we can spend eternity with him. That's our hope. But our desire for you to be a part of Collective is not tied to how much you believe. Now, I do want to share some reasons with you of why you can believe. I think this is important. And uh, one of the best, best ways and one of the best books ever written about this is a book called Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. Um, it, it's just incredible. And a little bit of a background on Lee Strobel. He was actually a journalist who was an atheist who set out to prove that Jesus didn't exist. And he wasn't just kind of some, some bum. He actually had a master's of studies and a law degree from Yale and was an award-winning journalist when he set out on this endeavor. And after research and after spending time and months trying to prove that Jesus didn't exist, he actually came to the opposite conclusion. He said that he couldn't find evidence that proved that Jesus wasn't real, and he actually became a follower of Jesus. And this book is incredible. If you've never read it before, I would encourage you to check it out, especially if you're somebody that has doubts, because this was not written by a Christian person, but an atheist trying to find truth and trying to find belief. And he writes a bunch of reasons why you can believe, but there are five things I want to point out today that I think are especially important when it comes to why you can believe that Jesus was real, that he did live a perfect life, that he died and resurrected from the dead. The first reason is this, changes to key social structures. 10,000 Jewish people after the time of Jesus began to change their customs and traditions that were thousands of years old. And, and the Jewish culture and the Jewish religion began, began to kind of pivot all around the time that Jesus existed. And the reason why this matters is because long before Jesus, there were other religions, there were other kings, there were other leaders, there were other people that said they were the chosen one of God, there were other people that said that they were prophets, but Judaism and these, and these Jewish Christians and these Jewish people never changed their beliefs. But something was clearly different about Jesus. And that could have been the miracles that he performed that they got to see or simply the way that he taught. But when Jesus was alive, we start to see this shift in Judaism. And we see tens of thousands of people who, who are raised in this religion start to pivot closer to Jesus and closer towards Christianity. The second reason is the celebration of baptism and communion. Now, that might seem a little bit weird that, that these things would prove that there is Jesus, but there are two things that celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And for thousands of years, there were prophecies that said a Savior was coming. There were prophecies that said someone would live, they would be God's son, that they would resurrect from the dead, that they would be the Messiah, the one sent to save this group of people. And for thousands of years, these Jewish people knew that eventually that was coming. And at the same time that Jesus lived... In the same time that Jesus was in his ministry, in the same time that Jesus died and rose from the grave, people began to celebrate baptism and communion. Upon filling, Jesus fulfilling these promises and these prophecies that were said for thousands of years, the church started to change some of the things that they valued. And they started to celebrate something that is attributed to Jesus. The third, and personally my favorite reason why I think you can believe that Jesus is real, is the conversion of skeptics. One of those skeptics was actually Jesus' brother, a guy named James. So Jesus wasn't an only child. Uh, he had other siblings. In fact, he had multiple brothers. And one of them was, was this guy named James, who publicly denied, while Jesus was doing ministry, publicly denied that he was the Son of God. But after Jesus resurrected from the dead, James saw him. In 1 Corinthians 15, 7, Paul actually writes, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And if you were kind of reading this, you know, if you were reading through it, it would be easy to gloss over, but it's important that he appeared to James because it was Jesus' brother. 
James later writes in James 1.1, 1, 1, and he calls himself a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, I, I have a, a few siblings, and I know if they came up to me and said, hey, I'm the chosen one, I'm the Messiah, I'd be like, no, probably not. Uh, I, would, I would really struggle to believe that, um, but the reality is if, if I struggled to believe that and then I saw my sibling die on a cross and resurrect from the dead, I would most likely believe. And that's exactly what James did. And James didn't actually just believe. Uh, James was actually eventually thrown off a temple and clubbed to death over his belief and faith in Jesus. The second skeptic is a guy named Paul, probably the most famous Christian of all time. He sp spends the beginning of his career killing Christians. Actually, the first Christian who was ever killed for their faith is this guy named Stephen. And, and when it was happening, they laid their clothes at the feet of Paul. It was his directive that said, we need to persecute Christians and we need to imprison and kill these people. But as he was walking to Damascus, he was blinded and Jesus spoke to him. And he turned his life around completely and began to follow Jesus and began to plant churches so that other people could experience this God they had persecuted. In Galatians 1.1, Paul writes, Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Jesus is saying, or Paul is saying in that moment, like, I, like this is not from me. This is not from human people but from Jesus who raised from the dead. Paul goes on to write the majority of the New Testament. He plants churches, and eventually he's killed for his beliefs. The fourth reason why I think you can believe that Jesus is real is the fact that the people who followed him, the disciples, died for their beliefs. Twelve of the thirteen, Judas eventually betrayed Jesus, and so uh, they added an, uh, a thirteenth whose name was Matthias. And twelve of those guys who followed Jesus, who were disciples, people who followed him and learned his teaching and then tried to live out that life after he resurrected from the dead, all of them were abused and beaten and eventually killed for their faith. Peter was crucified upside down because he didn't feel he was worthy to die the same way Jesus did. Andrew, who was Peter's brother, died by being severely beaten and then tied to a cross. James, the brother of John, was beheaded by a sword. John, his brother, was the only one that died of natural causes, but he was thrown into a vat of boiling oil for his faith. Philip was crucified. Bartholomew was beaten, flayed open, and then crucified. Thomas was speared and then thrown into an oven. Matthew was axed to death. Jude was crucified. Simon the Zealot was crucified. And Matthias, who replaced Judas, was stoned and then beheaded. What would you be willing to die for? Would you die for something that you weren't completely sure of? Would you die for something that you didn't see and experience firsthand? These men suffered horrible deaths because of the fact that they wouldn't denounce Christianity and they wouldn't say that Jesus wasn't real and they wouldn't say that Jesus was not the Son of God and because of that they died. I know for me, I believe in a lot of things, and, and I'm fairly confident in a lot of things, but I'm not sure there are any of those things that I'd be confident enough to be tortured and then killed. But that's what these men went through, because they refused to acknowledge that, that what people wanted to hear wasn't the reality. And they died proclaiming that Jesus was the Son of God and resurrected from the dead. And the fifth reason is this. Uh, the fifth reason why I think we know that Jesus is real is because of the church. The church didn't really start until Jesus resurrected from the dead. And I don't know if there's a better way to explain how 12 people, normal people, sinful people, broken people who had different careers, I don't know how else you can explain how these 10 regular people changed the world. I think if it wasn't true, the church probably would have died out a long time ago. But the people who saw Jesus resurrect from the dead... We're, doing, we're willing to do everything they could, including die, to tell other people that Jesus was real. Now, I recognize that listening to a few facts for a few minutes might not change your level of belief, and that's okay. One thing I would encourage you to do is read that book, Case for Christ. It's incredible. But I think it's important for people to know, whether you're doubtful or skeptical, or even if you're, you're not doubtful and you feel pretty confident, I, I think it's important for people to know that there are facts there are actual historical proofs that can prove that Jesus was real and that he did resurrect from the dead. But above facts, I think it's important to see how people who struggled to believe 
interacted with Jesus and were treated by Jesus. And so we're going to read a story in Mark 9, starting in verse 14. And so if you have a smartphone with you or you've got your Bible with you, I'd love for you to turn there. It's going to be on the screen so you can read it. But I want to share one of my favorite stories in the Bible uh, about a guy who, who struggles to believe and his interaction with Jesus. So Mark 9, starting in verse 14, this is what it says. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. Now, just a little bit of context. Jesus at this point has gained quite a following. Jesus had performed many miracles. People had, had seen it. So when Jesus went from town to town, people really wanted to approach him and really wanted to meet him. But what's really interesting is this crowd, these people who want to meet him, it doesn't mean they all believe. Some of the people did. Some of the people believe that he actually was the son of God. Some people believe that maybe he was a prophet. Some people flat out believe that he was possessed. But either way, Jesus was, was so captivating that when he came to a town and when people approached him, they wanted to sit down and they wanted to meet him. The story continues. What are, what are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. So this guy has a son who he believes is possessed by an evil spirit. And maybe this is true. Uh, it could be completely spiritual. Maybe it's medical. We don't really know. But the reality is this father is at a point where he has a son where he thinks something is wrong and he's at, he's, he's at, he's at the end of his rope. He wants him to go to Jesus because he doesn't know what else to do. He's tried other, other things. He's tried doctors, and he's, I'm sure he's tried other religions. And the reality is he gets to this point where he's like, okay, like, I don't know what to do. I've heard of this Jesus guy. I know he's performed miracles. Maybe he can help my son. The father's looking for a miracle. Jesus responds, you unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Now, this is kind of sassy. This is like sassy Jesus. You see that every once in a while. Uh, you unbelieving generation, like immediately. But Jesus is actually referencing and reaching back to the Old Testament when he says this. This is a reference to God's chosen people, the Israelites, who would often see God perform miracles, who would often hear God or experience God, but still had trouble believing. And Jesus is, is pointing back to that, saying, man, how much do I have to do to show you that you can believe? What else do I need to do? But how real is that feeling? There are times in our lives when we've experienced God, but we still struggle to believe. Maybe we see it in the lives of friends who have had marriages or families transformed. Maybe it's in seeing a group of people rally together and love a community. Or to be honest, maybe it's simply you just step outside at night in Frederick and see the beauty of this city. And in some way, you've, you've seen God and you've experienced God before. You've had a glimpse of him, but you still struggle to believe. And that's how a lot of these people feel. They had heard Jesus had performed miracles. I'm sure some of them had seen him perform miracles. They've had a glimpse of him, but they still struggle. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. Can you imagine what this father felt like? This thing that is, is plaguing his child, this pain that his child feels, has been something that he's had since he was a small kid. The reality is some of you are here today that have been hurting for just as long. You have pain that's left from a parent's divorce when you were a child. Maybe you have some insecurities from bullying of people that were your friends in high school. Or maybe you have doubts because you begged God to heal or to save or to fix something in your life years ago and nothing changed. You know, this father has been dealing with this pain from the beginning so you can kind of understand why he might struggle to believe. 
you can kind of understand where his doubts and skepticism comes from. The father continues, It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. This is one of my favorite interactions in the Bible, um, and it's not because of Jesus' response. It's because I completely understand what it's like to be the dad, to be approaching Jesus and say, God, if you can, to say, Jesus, if you can, please help me find the right job. Or Jesus, if you can, help me have the courage to stand up to my boss. Or Jesus, if you can, help me find the right person. Jesus, if you can, help me heal my family member's cancer. Or sometimes you ask, Jesus, if you can, just show me that you're real. I mean, when the dad says that, he's not trying to belittle Jesus. He's not trying to eliminate him or push him down. He just has doubts. And I think every single one of us know what it's like, whether you believe or you're doubtful or you're skeptical, or maybe you don't believe at all. We know what that feels like to be standing before God or to be praying or to be with friends who do believe and saying, okay, Jesus, if you can, show me something. And Jesus finishes by saying, everything is possible for one who believes. One thing I do want to make sure we understand that this doesn't mean that everything we want will happen. Um, This doesn't mean that because of belief, everything that we, we feel like we need or everything we approach God with will come true. That's not the way it works. What Jesus says is it's possible. It's possible that it can. And the baseline for that and for this father is belief. But check out how the dad responds in Mark 9, 24. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. Man, I love this. I love how honest the father is. I think in general, if you were sitting in front of God and he's like, if you believe, and you'd be like, yeah, totally. Like, I believe, I get it. I'm the best believer. There's no better believer than I am. But the dad is being real in this moment. He's saying, okay, like, I do believe. Like, I do believe that you can do this, mostly because I'm at the end of my rope and I don't have any other options. But help my unbelief. You know, he believed because Jesus was in front of him. And he wants more than anything for his son to be Okay but he doesn't pretend that he has it all together. He doesn't pretend that he doesn't have doubts. That even as he stands in front of Jesus and Jesus is with his son, he still isn't quite sure. The story ends and Jesus heals his son, even in the doubts that the father had. And I know for me, like when I read that story, I can't help but understand completely what the dad feels that there are times in my life where I stand before God as somebody who does believe and I still ask him, God, show me. Show me that you are real. Show me that, that what the Bible says about the fact that you were perfect and lived a perfect life and resurrected from the dead, God, show me that that's real. Do, do something. In Lee Strobel's book, uh, there's actually an additional fact that he talks about to prove that Jesus was real and did resurrect from the dead. It's the lives of people who follow Jesus. People who truly follow Jesus and put him first in their relationships and careers and finances and family. And what Lee Strobel says, when you look at those people, you can see that something's different. He points out that you look at a Christian person and see grace offered in ways that doesn't make sense in the real world that you can look at Christian people and you can see changed marriages or forgotten people that are cared for or cities changed or lives that have hope and peace that transcends any understanding considering what they're going through. And so here's my hope for you if you are somebody that has doubts. I hope you look at this story of the father and understand it's okay. It's okay to struggle to believe. It's okay to have unbelief. It's okay to have doubts and and be skeptical. But my hope for you is that you hang out at Collective long enough to see 
that this church is full of people that might not have an answer for it or might not know exactly why, but they can point back to the fact that their life is different, that they have hope, that they've experienced grace. And the only reasonable thing is that it comes from God. And so if you struggle to believe or have doubts, um, I think if you spend enough time here and meet enough people, you'll see that one, we get it. But two, a lot of lives have been changed and the only explanation is Jesus. Belief is hard, especially in a time like today. Uh, But we want you to know that no matter what, uh, no matter how much you believe and what your level of belief is, no matter if you feel skeptical or if you believe but have doubts that God is for you, Your level of belief doesn't change God's love for you. Your level of belief doesn't change his desire to be in a relationship with you. And your level of belief doesn't change God's ability to give you life and hope and purpose and forgiveness. I want you to know that Collective is a place where you can belong no matter what your level of belief is. Let's pray. God, thank you. God, thank you that even in our doubts, even in our um, skepticism, God, even in the fact that um, sometimes we just don't believe at all, that you are still for us. God, that, that you love us first, um, that you, you want to offer us forgiveness uh, and peace and love first. Um, and God, that it's not contingent on us getting it all together or not having any doubts or not having any skepticism at all. God, I do pray for the people that are here that are struggling, um, that they get a a glimpse of you this week. Whether that's through collective or through people in their lives, or God, ultimately, um, we just hope that they see you and that you can help their unbelief. God, thank you that we can be in a community and this can be a safe place where we can say, hey, we have doubts and it's okay. That we don't have to pretend like we have it all together. God, that we recognize that a lot of our our unbelief and our skepticism comes from pain. Um, And so, God, we're just thankful that that you could create a a community where we don't all have to believe the same thing or feel the same way or be in the same place. But, God, that we get to be a part of this together. God, thank you that you're for us. God, that you're for us in our unbelief, you're for us in our brokenness, you're for us even when we feel forgotten. God, thank you that you are for us. And God, we love you and we pray these things in your name. Amen.